Welcome fellow songwriters. Um, I'm Dan Colbert and this is the sixth episode of my series A Songwriter's Notes on Songwriting and uh, hope you'll subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel, listen to my uh, songs which I have on there and I'm continually uh, adding to that list. Um, you see that I have no guitar with me today uh, because we're just going to be talking about words. So, uh, no guitar needed. Um, and I hope this series is uh, helpful to you. I'm just uh, really sharing kind of my observations over the years as I've uh, developed on my own uh, songwriting uh, work. And uh, so, just digging in now into uh, lyrics, last time we started talking about lyrics, uh, and it's a tricky subject to talk about since it's so much more open-ended than um, uh, other parts of songwriting, uh, uh, particularly um, uh, harmony and, and rhythm. Melody will be harder yet to talk about, but that's ahead of us. And the reason, just backing up, the reason we talk so much about harmony, uh, your chord progression, is because um, there really are real boundaries to consider uh, in developing your harmonic structure, at least within the context of writing fairly traditional, listenable, popular Western songs, and which is the subject of this whole series. Um, your harmony establishes boundaries. You might say kind of a kind of house for the other elements of your song to live in. And similarly for rhythm, lyrics are so much more expansive in their possibilities. They kind of live in the house and can roam around. They have a lot of space to explore. So that's probably why I and most songwriters I've heard talk about this spend so much more time and energy on the lyrics than on the music. Um, I can, uh, it doesn't always happen this way, but I can, you know, in in an hour sometimes, or less even, develop a chord progression that's pretty complete. Uh, it takes me days or sometimes weeks, typically, to uh, fill out the lyrics. Um, also, I, I might mention that this might also be because most of us come uh, to this primarily as musicians and as, as uh, lyricists uh, secondarily. So we kind of have more of a natural feel for the music maybe than the words, some of us. Um, what I'm not going to do here is to try to subje suggest what subject matter you should write about. To me, unless it's hateful or destructive, it's all good. And uh, there's a lot to say. Uh, and this is your chance, of course, to express yourself with words and music. Uh, and isn't marrying up um, those incredibly expressive uh, uh, media, music, and, and words, uh, really the reason why songs are, are so powerful? Um, uh, but aside from the subject matter, there are still other practices in writing with words that make some lyrics better than others. And uh, that's what I'll talk today, mostly through examples, okay? Uh, so as I went digging for, for examples, I got hooked on a bunch of um, songs from my, uh, maybe my favorite songwriter in my lifetime, Paul Simon. In my view, he has a combination of strength in all the areas of songwriting uh, that are really unparalleled. Um, of course, this is very subjective, and I'm not going to try to defend this. Uh, there are a lot of great songwriters and he provides, uh, he just provides a lot of illustrations that I think will serve us well here in what I want to uh, bring up as far as writing lyrics. And he also happens to have talked a lot about the craft of songwriting and I'll bring in a few of, of his points. Um, I actually though want to begin uh, in kind of a more general way with a song from another favorite songwriter of mine, Joni Mitchell, who I think is right there with Paul Simon. Uh, as is well known, uh, she writes with such penetrating vulnerability 
that it's really hard not to feel touched and moved by her. Uh, this is as close as I'll get to suggesting subject matter. Personal is always good. Um, you know, if it comes from your heart, it's likely to touch other people. Uh, and especially if it's done in a way that's universal and that people can relate to. The best illustration, and I think one of the greatest songs uh, uh, ever, is um, uh, her song, A Case of You, from her album, Blue. Um, and I'm just going to read you the third verse of that song, okay? I remember that time you told me, you said, love is touching souls. Surely you touched mine, because part of you pours out of me in these lines from time to time. Now, it's wonderful to take in, just take in the sense and beauty of that verse. But there are some really special things that going on there that I want to uh, touch on. First of all, she admits directly that she's borrowing someone else's line, in this case, Graham Nash, who this song is about, with the, uh, the, the, the part of the line, uh, love is touching souls. Okay. Um, I guess maybe it's okay to steal if you're admitting it in the song itself. I don't know of another example uh, of that, but anyway, um, stealing is not so good. I don't really approve of that, unless it's stealing something, uh, you know, that's uh, open source. Like, I don't know, I've, I've stolen a couple lines from Shakespeare, for example, and other writers. Um, anyway, another thing about this verse is it's very, very clear and direct which can be a really beautiful thing, especially when it follows more image-laden lyrics. So there's sort of a trade-off or interplay between imagery, which is really powerful stuff. And uh, I strive to build imagery all the time. Uh, I never feel, or I often feel like I, I'm not quite there. Um, uh, but especially in contrast, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later with some of Paul Simon's music, uh, to get away from that nebulous or foggy, image-laden stuff and be very clear and direct can be very powerful and very beautiful. Um, the, the line, surely you touched mine because Part of you pours out of me in these lines from time to time. I mean, that's as direct and clear a statement uh, of one person's uh, influence uh, and effect on another as uh, you could imagine hearing. Uh, and the power of that is really almost overwhelming. Uh, that power is also is made even greater by the self-reference to these lines, okay? So she's being self-referential in the song itself. Um, again, not too many examples of that. It was really a brilliant touch. It brings it right here, right now. You can certainly feel it and almost touch it. It's immediate and refreshingly personal. Lastly, while this verse is very straightforward and direct, it does tie back to the main metaphor of the song, with the line, part of you pours out of me, okay, from time to time. The chorus is, I could drink a case of you. The title of the song is A Case of You. So she's comparing her lover to fine wine. And so, it, it, so in this verse, she's kind of hooking back into that lovely imagery. That's masterful writing, okay? So there's a directness, but with just one word, one idea, part of you pours out of me in these lines from time to time, hooking back to that imagery of, of wine and the, 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 the metaphor of the song um, is brilliant. It, it's just incredible, I think. So last time, uh, the main thing I said last time about lyrics was in connection to rhythm, and I really emphasize, and probably if there's one takeaway about lyric writing, it, it would be uh, it's got to have 
your lyrics have to have rhythm and they have to match in some way more or less loosely the rhythm of the song and the meter of the song, okay? They need to match in general, okay? Deviations from that are not only okay, they're important and maybe even essential, uh, but you need to have that foundation of music in, uh, in the words, okay? Um, if you stay always with exactly a squared up meter in the way that the words are, um, it will tire the ear, okay? So you need to have some variation, but you also need to be kind of foundationed in the basic meter. So it's a, it's a balance for sure. Um, now, in this song, Joni Mitchell always has that foundation, which then allows her to deviate from it and to play loosely with it. You know, I, I think part of the brilliance of her as a songwriter and a performer is, and it's well known, she, kind of, she was very interested in jazz, right, which can kind of play a little more loosely with uh, melody, with everything, melody, rhythm, uh, the, the way the lines are sung. Um, and she was brilliant at kind of uh, varying uh, the, the meter of, of the lyric. Um, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go back to, to that verse and just kind of clap and speak those first two lines of, of the verse, hoping that you'll hear that there is a meter to it, but that it's not just kind of squared up and dun da dun da dun da dun da dun da dun. Okay. So here it goes. I remember that time you told me you said love is touching souls. Okay. So it's there, but it's um it's not um you know, dead on, uh, there's a lot of variation in that. And uh, I'll speak to that, uh, to, to a simple example of that right now um, uh, in one of Paul Simon's most famous songs. Uh, let's think about the first line of the chorus of Bridge Over Troubled Waters, which is simply like a bridge over troubled water. Okay, now this is in the dum da dum da the, the first syllable of two is stressed, okay, that we talked about last time. dum da okay. Uh, it's, uh, technically, it's called trochaic pentameter, his line. Um, uh, iambic pentameter, which Shakespeare used, is dum da dum da This is the opposite. dum da dum da five times, okay, per line. But notice that the word bridge, which is just one syllable, takes the place of a whole dumta, okay? Uh, this is an example of the exception that, that breaks the rule uh, and helps the ear, uh, creates interest for the ear. He has that foundation of rhythm in the line, but he can, as Shakespeare and every other poet and good songwriter does as well, uh, he can violate it here and there, again, which engages the ear. Um, now think about what that does to the melody as well. Substitute a two-syllable word for bridge. Say, drawbridge, okay? Uh, just to keep it close. And drawbridge is, is a dumta word, right? The, the emphasis is on the first syllable. So it's kind of a perfect word to substitute in, okay? drawbridge. So if we sing it, you know, like a drawbridge over troubled water, right? So that's what I kind of mean by very squared up. But contrast that with what he did, right? Just the word bridge covering um, uh, what would be two syllables if you squared it up. Like a bridge over troubled water. 
So that, ex that extending that um, creates a little bit of a deviation from the basic pattern, the basic meter of the song, which is an interesting and beautiful thing. It helps to emphasize the word bridge and it, um, uh, you know, it, it, um, it, 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 it helps create a melody line that is, I think, more beautiful than it would otherwise be, okay? Um, so these departures from the rule of kind of matching the meter of the words to the uh, rhythm and the meter of the music uh, is really important. And so I, I just want you to understand this is a critical balance to look for. You want to have that foundation, but you also want to um, have exceptions to it. If you stay, uh, one thing that I've noticed with beginning songwriters a lot is that they tend to um, stay too squared up, and that again tires out the ear. Okay. Um, Paul Simon is a good focus here, as I mentioned before, not only because of his great songwriting, but also he loves to talk about the craft of songwriting in interviews. Uh, in fact, for many years, he even taught a course on songwriting at NYU. Let me give you this quotation. Uh, he says, it's easier to talk about words with words than to describe melody, harmony, and rhythm. Musicians focus more on the music. The music always precedes the words. The words often come from the sound of the music and eventually evolve into coherent thoughts or incoherent thoughts. Rhythm plays a crucial part in the lyric making as well. It's like a puzzle to find right words to express what the music is saying." End quote. Okay, so he again is reiterating that crucial connection between the rhythm and words. Now, whatever you think of Mr. Simon, I don't see how you could argue my assertion that he's among the greatest masters of first lines in songs. So this is something I think it's worth paying attention to. And let me just give you a few examples, okay, that are pretty well known. One is the boxer. I am just a poor boy, though my story seldom told. I have squandered my resistance for a pocket full of mumbles, such are promises. Now, I mean, there's a lot to chew on in that, but it just sounds musical, right? It's very musical sounding. And if there's one thing, even more than the meaning of what you're saying, your words need to have a music of their own, even apart from any melody, okay? They need to have a music. And that's about rhythm, but it's about more than rhythm. It's about the actual sounds of the words themselves and how they join together and flow and come out of the mouth. All of those things, you need to pay attention to those. We're creating music here. Words are musical. Um, poets pay, a, uh, this isn't poetry, and I'll get to that in a minute, but po poets pay an enormous amount of attention to kind of the music of their words, even though they're not being sung. His song, America, let us be lovers, we'll marry our fortunes together. Graceland, this is one of my favorites. The Mississippi Delta was shining like a national guitar. What imagery. I mean, to me, you know, in my mind, you know, I just see a guitar the size of America lying along the Mississippi River you know, probably painted red, white, and blue. It's just an amazing image and metaphor. From 50 ways to leave your lover, the problem is all inside your head, she said to me. So, um, you know, by the way, please notice that each of these first lines establishes the meter of the lyric solidly and pretty squarely right from the start. So it's perhaps a good idea to avoid or to hold off on those variations, as we talked about uh, and illustrated with Bridge, until you've established the meter. It's 
good to get a good foundation right off the bat. Uh, the first and third of the examples I just gave from the Boxer and Graceland are really crammed with um, imagery. And the other two are more direct, but still kind of evoke strong feelings, okay? I don't know any songwriter who so consistently starts with super strong lines, but I do know that that's a great way to begin a song. And it certainly gets the listener's attention. Much easier said than done, though. Another technique that I've noticed from uh, Paul Simon is he often... Uh, he may go through a song with a lot of imagery, maybe it's a little nebulous, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, ambiguity is a great thing. Um, but sometimes, not always certainly, but sometimes he'll use a technique where he ends the song or somewhere towards the end with real clarity and directness. He kind of pulls the threads together of the meaning of the song. And he did this beautifully with uh, his song Train in the Distance from his um, mid-80s album Hearts and Bones. And it ends like this. Again, it's full of kind of uh, imagery and uh, not entirely clear what's going on in the preceding part, but this is the last verse. What is the point of this story? What information pertains? The thought that life could be better is woven indelibly into our, heart, our hearts and our brains. Okay. I mean, you know, there's, I, I, don't, I don't know how you could say that more directly. Okay. And it ties into, it suddenly kind of shines a big light on the preceding part of the song. This also speaks a little bit to another subject I want to bring up quickly, what I call preaching. I sometimes find it hard not to preach because in my old age, I think I have all the answers. But people don't usually want that in a song. But if you've carefully laid the groundwork, it can really open up a song to be clarifying, not necessarily preachy. Uh, I don't think what Paul Simon wrote uh, in that song was really preachy, but uh, it can open up the song to be that direct and clarifying about what the rest of the song is about, okay? So next I want to talk about editing a little bit. Um, Paul Simon isn't the only songwriter I've heard talk about the importance of editing. Any writer, whether you're writing a novel, a poem, a short story, memoirs, whatever you're writing, editing is an enormously important part of the process. Um, and we all need to edit. And there's a tension in editing, and Paul Simon talks about this beautifully, uh, between too much and too little. Um, he doesn't believe, for example, in, um, in, in the idea of uh, writer's block. Because what he says writer's block really is, is that you're being so self-critical that you can't even get off the starting blocks. It's not whatever kind of proto-idea you're having, you're telling yourself it's not good enough to even get going. Okay, so that's kind of an, an example of over-editing in a sense, right? You're not allowing yourself um, much space and expansiveness. Uh, but of course, we sometimes we can under edit too we can we can uh, you know today i was working on a song and i got to a point where yeah it's a pretty good yeah i feel like i've got kind of the elements of it but i know i'm going to go back and refine and work on that so you 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 don't want to be too satisfied too quickly now there are special cases that i've experienced and i know other songwriters have experienced where something just kind of pours out and it's sort of feels a little bit like magic. Uh, there's a famous story of Neil Young writing three huge hit songs, uh, Down by the River, Cinnamon Girl, and Cowgirl in the Sand, all on the same day while he was in bed with the flu, okay? Um, and, you know, so sometimes things just happen, right? Uh, but in general, most of us need... Um, 
some editing, and we should pay attention to that. Um, so I want to give you just kind of what I think is kind of a cute example from Paul Simon that he, uh, I read recently an interview uh, with him where he talked about this. Uh, from that same album, Hearts and Bones, there's a song called A Song About the Moon. Uh, and in it, he has the line, walk along the craters in the afternoon. Yeah, it starts out, if you want to write a song about the moon, walk along the craters in the afternoon. And in the interview, he says, you know, I could have written of the afternoon, walk along the craters of the afternoon. But he said, yeah, that's just too, it sounds too much like poetry right? It's too kind of highfalutin. Um, and he makes a big point about writing songs. It, you have to write songs in the vernacular, as he says, okay? In kind of common speech. Um, and the reason for that is that's what we're used to hearing, okay? We're not used to hearing fancy poetry in songs and, you know, really high imagery and metaphors and, um, uh, and fancy, fancy words that aren't a common part of, of uh, usage. Um, so right in the vernacular. Now, he also says, and I agree with this, sometimes you want to insert, you know, here and there a little special word, an unusual word. Uh, I think one song on that album he talked about uh, using the word alien. Maybe it was even the same song. Uh, and alien is not a word, you know, you normally hear in, in songs, popular songs. But, you know, if you're mostly writing in the vernacular, again, it's kind of the exception that makes the rule, right? You, you can get away with a few exceptions here and there, just don't do too much and realize that you're not really writing poetry, you're writing music and song lyrics. Okay. Anyway, getting back to, to uh, uh, this example, you know, in the afternoon, walk along the craters in the afternoon, well, we can all relate to that. You know, you could, you could imagine, he lived in New York, he lives in New York, you know, you can imagine walking in Central Park and there are those giant rocks or maybe there's some craters or something. And, you know, it's something you can kind of feel and, 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 and see in your, your mind. If he had written Walk Along the Craters of the Afternoon, now, you know, it's in, if it were a poem, that I think that would be really interesting. So I'm not saying it's not interesting. What I think he meant was it will distract the listener too much. Songs flow by. It, when you're reading poetry, you can go as slow as you want, pause, go back, you know, and so forth. Songs keep moving. So you don't want to get the listener hung up trying to figure out, what did he mean, craters of the afternoon? What that, what's that about? Even if it's really, really interesting and a wonderful uh, wordplay or whatever it is. So you want to be careful not to, um, to, to understand that you're, that something is flowing here like a river. It's not a poem. It's not something a person is standing in. It's flowing by them. So they have to be able to, the listener has to be able to process it. Okay. So I think that's a kind of important uh, thing to realize. And it's part of editing. Even, I mean, this example, this is between the replacing the word of with the word in, two two letter words, right? So even one very small word can make a really big difference. Edit yourself, not too much. Um, appreciate if that if you know you were in a truthful and open place when you wrote something when you first wrote it down, give it the proper credit, okay? So don't over-edit, don't under-edit, okay? It's tricky. Told you this is tricky. Uh, alliteration is another device, right? I probably do a little too much of this. It can get a little tiring to the ear if you alliterate too much. 
but it can also create a pretty delicious effect when used well. Um, a favorite example of mine is such a slight alliteration that you might not even notice it as such. And it's uh, the following line in Paul Simon's song, Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes from Graceland. And the line is this, by the bodegas and the lights on Upper Broadway. Okay. That B intensity, by the way, bodegas is one of those words I, I don't know of any other song I've heard that in, maybe, but not many. Uh, so it's an interesting word, and it just kind of, the mouth feel of it, it flows off out of the mouth really beautifully by the bodegas, by the, by the bodegas and the lights on Upper Broadway. Uh, it's great to sing, it's very musical, even just speaking it. It also ties into the last word of the song, Broadway. So you've got three B's in there, by the bodegas and the lights on Upper Broadway, okay? So alliteration is um, something in words, but it's a musical device, okay? The sound is what it's playing on, okay? So look for such musical combinations of words and syllables. Um, okay. So I, I want to kind of hmm, take a tour through a whole song of Paul Simon's. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm picking Paul Simon here for reasons I mentioned. Uh, there are lots of other people and songs that I could, you know, but, uh, that I could do this with. Uh, so this is really a little bit random. But I want to look at one of his great songs called Something So Right. It's pretty simple lyrically but it's also doing a lot of beautiful, beautiful things. So I'm going to read the first verse and then I'll say something about it and go on. You got the cool water when the fever runs high. You got the look of love light in your eyes. And I was in crazy motion till you calmed me down. It took a little time, but you calmed me down. So right off the bat, he has, you know, you got the cool water when the fever runs high. There's imagery, but it's also really tactile, right? Cool water, fever, we can feel the fever. You know, so it's right present and uh, right, right there for us. But it's also powerful imagery. You've got the look of love light in your eyes. So he's kind of bringing it, again, back home. You know, it's like someone lying in bed sick, uh, looking up at someone. It's really a, a powerful, forceful image. And I was in crazy motion till you calm me down. I was in crazy motion. There's something in the theme about being in crazy motion, and it connects with the fever, right? Till you calm me down with that cool water. And then it, it kind of reiterates it a different way. It took a little time, but you calmed me down. And there's just something lovely about that. There's turmoil and then there's resolution. Very beautiful, very harmonious. And the music works with that as well. And then the chorus is very straightforward, okay? This song isn't trying to do anything very tricky or get you to think a whole lot. It just goes, when something goes wrong, I'm the first to admit it. I'm the first to admit it that the last ones know. When something goes right, well, it's likely to lose me. It's apt to confuse me. It's such an unusual sight. I can't get used to something so right, something so right. And I think we've all felt that, had that kind of feeling, right? Um, depending how secure or insecure or neurotic we are, uh, I think we get that. So here's, it's, it's a universal theme he's playing with to connect with people. That's what great songs do. I want to read the um, second verse. They've got a wall in China. It's a thousand miles long. To keep out the foreigners, they made it strong. I've got a wall around me you can't even see. It took a little time to get next to me. So, wow. So he starts again with more imagery. Something, it's not abstract, it's quite concrete. The wall in China, it's a thousand miles long. To keep out foreigners, they made it strong. Um, but it's a metaphor. 
It's a powerful metaphor for what's coming, right? I got a wall around me. Can't even see it. It took a little time. And then again, you know, so there's that tension. I've got a wall around me, you know. I'm separated from the rest of the world. Um, uh, takes me back to his song, I Am a Rock from Simon and Garfunkel days. If you look up the lyrics, it's a similar theme. But anyway, uh, it took a little time to get next to me. It resolves back to that loveliness of, thank you, my darling, for being next to me and getting inside my wall. Um, it's beautiful. It's vulnerable. It's beautiful. It's personal. And then there's, and then the bridge goes in a little bit different direction and bridges, I haven't talked about bridges, but they're incredible opportunities to kind of add a layer of meaning um, musically as well. You can go in a different direction, maybe a modulation, but lyrically uh, really kind of add to and expand the ideas. So I'll just read it first. Some people never say the words, I love you. It's not their style to be so bold. Some people never say those words, I love you. But like a child, they're longing to be told. Okay. And musically, at, at that last line, it kind of soars, and then he goes into the chorus. It's, it's really an incredibly effective, um, uh, musically, but... The lyrics, the, the building of the lyrics, like a child longing to be told. Again, this universal feeling of we all want to be loved and told that we're loved. Um, and the power of the soaring music into the chorus just makes that incredibly effective. So, um, you know, I could go on and on talking about uh, words I had thought about uh, bringing in some examples from my own music. I'm going to post in the comments some songs that contain some lyrics that uh, uh, I think follow a lot of these points that uh, I may, I'm making or I've tried to follow a lot of them and uh, hope you enjoy listening to them. And until next time, when I think we're going to start talking about melody next time, uh, uh, I hope you'll stay in tune.